Hello, my name is Chelsea Sawyer, and I work for the Chatham Emergency Management Agency, otherwise known as SEMA. Today we're going to talk about hurricane preparedness and asking if you're ready for hurricane season. We're going to go over a little bit of hurricane basics, what you can do before a storm, during a storm, and after. All right, let's start with some of the basics. Hurricane season runs from June the 1st to November the 30th. That is a six month time span that hurricanes are possible here within Chatham County. Hurricanes are classified into five different categories and we'll talk about what those categories mean later on in the presentation, but it's important to understand and to remember that these categories are based on wind speed only. and They don't take any other factors into consideration. These tropical systems form over warm ocean waters, and that's actually what gives these hurricane fuel. Um, it's the most important part that makes a hurricane continue to strengthen and add more complexity into the hurricane. If it were, runs into cold water or a cold system, it will actually start to diminish. Peak hurricane season is September the 10th. They nail it down to a particular day. Um, when you think about peak hurricane season, you think all summer long the, the ocean waters are continuing to warm. We talked about how warm water is the fuel for these hurricanes. So if it's got all summer to bake in the sun and continue to get that heat to rise into those oceans and actually sink down deep into those ocean waters, it makes sense that peak hurricane season is going to be in September. Hurricane size is important. These tropical systems can be hundreds of miles wide or they can be less than 100 miles wide. And that's what makes hurricanes so intense and so uh, difficult to nail down is to figure out that they could be larger than the state of Texas or they can be smaller than the state of Rhode Island. And it's kind of strange to think about the size of hurricanes changing that much. Some other things to think about when it comes to hurricanes are the threats that are associated with them. The first thing that people automatically think about are strong winds. It's no secret that hurricanes are classified by wind speeds. That's why we have categories one through five there. I mean, we'll talk about each of those different categories and what, what you can expect in regards to wind speeds. Tornadoes are a huge threat when it comes to hurricanes because they can start to happen in those outer bands and particularly in that upper right hand quadrant. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Storm surge is incredibly important here in Chatham County and especially along the coast um, anywhere along the eastern United States. Storm surge is one of the greatest threats to life and to property. And then heavy flooding and rainfall. There's no secret that heavy flooding um, can be caused by rain that's happening right before the storm, in the middle of the storm, and after the storm. Rainfall can definitely be very deadly. So we talked about those wind speeds here. They're broken out into these different categories, starting with a Category 1. Uh, category 1 winds start at 74 miles per hour. So prior to a Category 1, you have what's called a tropical storm. Uh, so once you reach that 74 mile per hour wind threshold, you are now into a hurricane category. So category one is at 74 to 95. Category two, 96 to 110 miles per hour. Category three, 111 to 129 miles per hour. Category four is at 130 to 156. And then category five, the largest category that we have, is going to be 156 miles per hour or higher. Again, that's just looking at wind speed. A lot of times people have a misconception that hurricane categories are based more than just wind speeds, that it has to do with the size of the storm or the intensity of the storm. It does not. It only has to do with that wind speed. Now, I want to ask a question here. Do categories really matter? I'm going to work, work you through a few different photos here, and we'll talk about why these are important. But this is a photo of a home here in Chatham County following a storm. Did the category really matter for this homeowner when they were thinking about what happened and what their recovery state is going to look like? What about this one? In the back of this home, they have completely lost a bedroom. They've completely lost access to that back portion of the house. They can't necessarily drive underneath of um, that tree that's fallen. It's incredibly unstable. I don't think a category storm really mattered for them either. They just know that their entire house is ruined. 
And what about this one here too? Uh, a tree has fallen on top of their home. They did a fantastic job in shuttering their windows, but the tree is actually punctured through that shuttered window up front. Category storm didn't matter to them. All they saw was that their house was damaged. So these are all homes in Chatham County that were damaged after, I'm going to use air quotes here, Hurricane Matthew. Hurricane Matthew was not a hurricane here in Chatham County. It was a tropical storm. So if you go back to those numbers that we looked at earlier, it wasn't even on the record. It wasn't even meeting the minimum standard for a hurricane. It was simply a tropical storm. And the damage like this still happened. Something that I want you to fully comprehend and understand is that just because it's not a hurricane or just because it's only a category one doesn't mean that these storms can't produce significant damage. Chatham County has a huge tree canopy here. You couldn't go a couple of miles after Tropical Storm Matthew without finding trees that had fallen down on top of homes, without having power lines completely collapse because trees had fallen on top of them. We have a beautiful tree canopy here, but it can be incredibly dangerous. If you have a tree outside of your home or anywhere near your home, you could be at risk of that tree falling on top of it, regardless of how strong those winds are, regardless if it's a tropical storm or a hurricane. So I ask the question again, do the categories really matter? Or do you need to pay more attention to what could actually happen here? If we're saying that a tropical storm could come, but we're saying to expect really high and strong winds for an extended period of time, I still want you to listen to that piece, not necessarily that it's only a tropical storm that's coming or only a category one storm that's coming. Remember that these categories are based on wind speed only, and they don't take any of those other things into consideration. They highlight the potential damage, but that potential damage could be a little bit skewed because it's based on the entire United States and not Chatham County specifically. They didn't ask our opinion when they talked about these wind speeds. They didn't say, well, according to Chatham County, it's gonna be this type of wind speed and what type of damage you can expect. It's nationwide. The damages here could be much higher from a much smaller wind storm because of our tree canopy. And it does not address any other potential dangers such as uh, storm surge, rainfall amounts, or tornadoes when it gives you those category storms. So just think about that the next time we have a storm heading our way. The next threat that we talked about are tornadoes. A majority of the tropical cyclones um, that are produced in the Atlantic Basin will produce at least one tornado. It's a very interesting fact. Tornadoes are extremely common uh, during the uh, tropical cyclone process. They can even occur for several days after landfall. So after the storm has come and gone, the disruption in the atmosphere can still exist and tornadoes could still be possible. In general, the tornadoes that happen during a tropical cyclone are pretty short-lived though. So we're not talking about the types of tornadoes that happen out in the Midwest that could go on for several miles. These ones are likely going to be a little bit shorter. Now the majority of the tornadoes are going to occur in the upper or front right quadrant of the cyclone. So cyclones move in a counterclockwise motion. And that's important to understand and to know because that's where the disruption is going to occur. Now, when you think of a, a quadrant here, the tornadoes are gonna happen in that upper right-hand quadrant because water is being pushed and pulled in that cyclonic method. So as water is being pushed and pulled, the most disrupted area is going to be where those tornadoes are going to happen. It's also gonna be where storm surge will happen, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So we spent some time talking about wind. We spent time talking about um, tornadoes and what can happen during a tropical cyclone, but the greatest threat to life is actually going to be water. 90% or thereabout are res uh, of um, deaths, direct deaths related to tropical cyclones are because of water or water-related um, instances. So storm surge, rain, surf, um, deaths that have happened offshore of people um, in boats or in crafts. Um, a lot of those deaths are associated because people 
are driving through floodwaters. That's one thing that you have to know and you have to pay attention to. You should never drive through flooded waters after a storm or during one of our regular rainstorms that we have throughout the year. If it's severe weather um, and we have flooding that is on our roadways, it's always best for you to turn around, don't drown, and never drive through those flooded roadways. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Wind is not the primary threat when it comes to the, the sacrifice of your life or your property uh, for a tropical cyclone. I think a lot of times people associate because uh, categories of storms are based on wind speed that wind is going to be the, the deadliest part, but it's actually going to be water. And that's something that you really should understand here in Chatham County. All right, so we've spent some time talking about storm surge, but what exactly is it? So the textbook definition is an abnormal rise of sea level generated by storm-driven winds and atmospheric pressure. But I think it's easier to explain storm surge by thinking of an actual example. So let's go back to September 2017 and Hurricane Irma. Now, Hurricane Irma, if you guys remember here in Chatham County, was actually pretty dangerous out on Tybee Island where we saw floodwaters rise up. And not only on Tybee, but it started to hit Whitmarsh Island and Wilmington Island. That water just slowly started rising from the ocean. That's what storm surge is. Now, Irma was very strange and that in the Tampa Bay, for one of the first times on record, it completely went out. So people could walk out for miles where they had never been able to walk before. That's due to storm surge. So water is moving in some places and pushing on shore in others. So let's take a look at our slide here and, and think back to that cyclonic motion that we talked about earlier, how storms move in this counterclockwise motion. So when you think about that counterclockwise motion, water at the bottom is going to be pulled out whereas water at the top is going to be pushed back in. So what happened in the Tampa Bay was that water was being pulled out because of Hurricane Irma. And what happened here on Tybee Island and in the rest of the coastal area of Chatham County is that water was being pushed inland. Now storm surge can vary in its severity depending on rainfall, depending on the tides. High tide and a heavy storm surge can be absolutely catastrophic here in our county. You also have to think about the river input that we have and how our waterway system is interconnected all throughout the county. So all of those things will play a role in how bad storm surge can actually be here. Keep in mind too that storm surge can happen during a tropical storm or a hurricane. It doesn't have to just be a large category hurricane to see storm surge within our community. Hurricane Irma in Chatham County was only a tropical storm, but we saw more storm surge than we had seen in previous hurricanes throughout our county. So storm surge here in this video will start to show you how this is our slope here. It's very gradual slope. Unlike in the, unlike in the northern areas of the East Coast, where there's a, a steeper slope line, ours just gradually starts to increase. So the water is able to just continuously rise. And then on top of that, you've got your high tide that's coming in and your waves that are crashing on top. So you're going from a low storm and it's just continuously rising and pushing inland. And that water is heavy and it's going to continue to knock things down that's in its path. You do not want to be in the path of water because it doesn't care and it will just continue to push further and further inland as long as that storm is continuing to push it and continuing to progress it forward. So we get a lot of questions about what storm surge would look like here in Chatham County. I want to give you a few images that will show you what, it's, what it could look like. Now consider this though. These are considered maximum of the maximums. So they're the maximum envelopes of water. All that's saying is that it's the worst case scenario. They're based on categories here, but don't get confused again. Remember, categories of storms are based on wind speed only. This is just to show you, based on a typical or standard category one storm, what the worst case scenario could be. We'll talk about what makes storm surge the worst possible after I show you these images, but I wanna give you an idea 
of what this means here in Chatham County and that it's not just a coastal threat. Storm surge is a huge threat for all of Chatham County. So this is what Chatham County looks like without any storm surge. Let's go ahead and progress forward to a category one. In a category one storm surge, in that worst case scenario, you're already seeing Tybee Island covered in water. You're seeing Wilmington Island, Whitmarsh Island, all the way up to almost the Harry Truman Parkway is completely covered in water. Now we're not talking about just a few inches of water either. We're talking about several feet of water possible. Now keep in mind too, a lot of people will say, well that's not gonna happen in my area or in my home because I'm in flood zone X or I have this particular flood zone. Storm surge does not care about your flood zones. Flood zones are based on fresh water flooding only. And that's essentially water that is falling down from the sky. Storm surge is water that's coming in from the ocean. So just because you're in a flood zone X or you have a higher flood zone, flood zone X is considered the best category for insurance rates, just in case you were wondering why I keep referencing flood zone X. Just because you're in that flood zone does not mean that you're not susceptible to storm surge. Every area in Chatham County is susceptible to storm surge, so make sure that you keep that in mind. So storm surge, let's go back to our category one storm here. You're already up to almost Highway 17 here. Connections to Bryan County up on uh, near I-95 is covered in water as well. And this is just that category one worst case scenario storm. Let's take it one step further and look at a category two. You're starting to fill in more. You're getting closer um, to that I-95 line. You're, you're creeping a little bit closer to I-16 here through your interconnected waterways. Um, you are now covered through the Harry Truman Parkway through most of it. You're covering a good portion of the Veterans Parkway and Highway 17. You're scooching closer and closer to the center of the county. That's only a category two worst case scenario. Let's take it a step further to that category three. Category three is catastrophic to Chatham County. You start to see an island form in the center of the county, and then you still see areas up near Jimmy Deloge Parkway, parts of Pooler, um, and parts of Port Wentworth that are still going to be outside of um, the flooded category. Um, but for the most part, you've got islands left in Chatham County, and this is a Category 3 storm. Let's take it one step further to a Category 4. Category 4, you have two pretty distinct islands that have started to form within the county. The one near um, the bottom of your screen, near I-516, in between Harry Truman Parkway and Veterans Parkway, that is actually going to be a good portion of Hunter Army Airfield. Hunter Army Airfield was built higher um, when it came into Chatham County, so that's why it's not going to be in a storm surge zone. But keep in mind, if you're next to Hunter, or if you work or live on Hunter, that does not mean that you're immune uh, to storm surge. That just means that everything around you is likely going to flood. But if you're the only dry land, and there is flood waters all the way around you, you're really not in a safe location because there are gonna be other things that will start to join you, including wildlife, other people that are stranded or have been flooded out of their homes or flooded out of their area. It's not a safe place to be. Now up in the top right-hand corner of this map, you start to see another island that is formed. So if the bottom portion of the map was Hunter Army Airfield, I have to wonder, what's going to be that top portion? It's the Savannah Hilton Head International Airport. That's the second highest ground here in Chatham County, and that's going to be your other area that you're going to be able to stage resources and, and have um, a safer location. But remember, not any, there's no location in Chatham County that's going to be safe necessarily from storm surge. But, this is only a category four. Let's take it one step further and see what a category five looks like. Category five isn't much different. According to these maps that were produced in 2012, uh, those are gonna be the two highest grounds when it comes to storm surge, and that's going to be the areas that are gonna be the safest here in the county. 
um, storm surge, the, the idea of showing you these maps and bringing this to light is that storm surge is something that affects the entire county, not something that just affects Tybee Island or Wilmington Island or Whitmarsh Island, but even people that live in Pooler or in Port Wentworth or in Bloomingdale, all of those areas are likely to be affected by storm surge. So factors that influence storm surge. I told you I would, I would help you get to this. The first one, storm intensity. The stronger the winds, the higher the potential for storm surge. So you have to think, we talked about that, how the, the motion, the counterclockwise motion that storm surge makes. If you've got larger winds that are pushing and pooling that water, you have the potential for that water to be pushed further and further inland. So the storm intensity plays a huge role. The higher the intensity, the higher the potential for storm surge. The size of the storm. The size of the storm plays a pretty large role. The larger the storm, the higher storm surge it will produce. Same thing with the intensity. If you've got larger waves and a larger storm that's pushing its way on shore, it's going to cause more storm surge to come into our area. Winds are pushing on a larger area of the ocean too. So not only do you have a large high intensity storm coming, but it's gonna continue to push and push and push for an extended period of time. All right, the storm's forward speed. Similarly, with the storm intensity and with the size, the forward speed plays a huge role. A slower system is gonna produce higher surge. Um, it's gonna produce higher surge more inland. So if you have a slow storm that's kind of pushing and moving at maybe five, six miles an hour, it's gonna stay over top of you for a longer period of time. So instead of just kind of brushing past us and moving forward, it's going to have more time to dump more water. So it's gonna have heavier rainfall. It's gonna have more time to continue to push and push and push into those interconnected waterways that we have throughout the entire county. So you're likely to see some of that extended category three, category four storm surge in a slower moving storm that is high intensity and very large. Now a faster storm is gonna have higher surge on the coast. So we saw that with Hurricane Irma. Irma came and went pretty quickly. Uh, but we had higher surge on the coastline because it was able to move very, very fastly uh, through our area. And then the last part that plays a huge role in storm surge is gonna be the angle of approach. If we have a direct hit storm, you're likely to have higher storm surge than if we were not hit directly or if it skirts the coast. The worst case scenario for storm surge is gonna be if it hits in that upper right-hand quadrant or that front right-hand quadrant that we talked about earlier with tornadoes. Not only is, is that quadrant the most deadly for tornadoes, but it also produces the highest amount of storm surge. So if there were a direct hit storm, maybe to Jacksonville or to the Brunswick Glen County area, that would put us on what is called the deadly side of the storm. And that means that we're gonna have higher chance of tornadoes, higher chance of storm surge, and a lot higher chance of some negative impacts to our community. So the angle of approach plays a huge role. So to recap, a high intensity storm that's very, very large, that's very slow, and hits at the right angle of our coastline could be catastrophic, and that's when we would see some of those worst case scenarios that we just showed you in those maps. All right, so we talked about storm surge, but remember that storm surge was only 49% of those direct deaths related to tropical cyclones. The other 27% that starts to make up that 90% for water related deaths is heavy rainfall and flooding. So weaker systems, that's gonna be your tropical storms and your lower category storms can actually produce more rainfall and flooding. I'm not sure you know, why it seems, but they produce typically more rainfall and, and more um, flooding with, with those than those large scale hurricanes. The size of the hurricane matters, just like the size matters in storm surge, 
it matters more um, with heavy rainfall and flooding. So bigger storms tend to produce that more rainfall. So we think back to Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston in 2017. The forward motion was not very fast. It was a very slow moving storm. It was very, very large and it sat over top of Houston for an extended period of time. Then it went up slightly and then came back down to Houston and just continued to sit over top of them and pour buckets and buckets of rain. Those slow moving, high um, intensity and, and large storms are gonna produce the greatest amount of, of rainfall. Um, the forward motion, like I said, is, is really important. Let's think back to Hurricane Dorian. Now, Chatham County was very blessed to not have to um, have a lot of impacts from Hurricane Dorian, but the Bahamas were not so fortunate. This, the storm actually sat over the Bahamas and did not move for several days. It actually calculated at zero miles per hour, which meant that it was not moving at all and just continued to dump buckets and buckets of rain on top of the Bahamas. That's why they saw a lot of the catastrophic damages that they did was because of the rain and flooding that it caused. Um, so those slower moving storms, those really large storms, um, and typically can be weaker systems are going to produce the most amount of rainfall. All right. Let's talk about watches and warnings. There's a lot of confusion that comes with those, so I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about those. Let's start with a tropical storm watch. A tropical storm watch means that tropical storm conditions are possible within the next 48 hours. Now on the flip side, we've got a tropical storm warning. Tropical storm warning means that those tropical storm conditions are possible within 36 hours. Let's take it up a step. A hurricane watch. A hurricane watch means that hurricane conditions are possible, but tropical storm force winds are possible within 48 hours. Now that's a little different. A lot of people assume that hurricane force winds would be possible within 48 hours. The reason they base it off of tropical storm force winds is because that's when your planning needs to be done. That means when tropical storm force winds happen is when you need to have already evacuated, you need to make sure that you are at home or you are at a safe location um, or you are out of the area. You do not want to be out and about during tropical storm force winds, which is why they base their hurricane watches and warnings off of tropical storm conditions. So that's a hurricane watch. Let's take it a step further to a hurricane warning. Hurricane warning means that there are hurricane conditions possible within the area and tropical storm force winds are possible within 36 hours. Now you will always see tropical storm force winds before you see those hurricane force winds because tropical storm force winds surround those hurricane force winds, which is again another reason why they base hurricane watches and warnings off of those tropical storm force winds. All right, we talked about tornadoes earlier. Let's talk about the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning. A tornado watch is when weather conditions are favorable to produce a tornado, a severe thunderstorm is likely. So your tornado watches can last several hours because they can say uh, that a severe thunderstorm likely to bring tornadoes in is coming into this area. Be on the lookout for um, rapidly changing conditions. Now a tornado warning is something that comes out and you need to immediately take shelter. So a tornado warning means that a tornado has been sighted or indicated by radar and there is imminent threat um, to, or an imminent threat or danger to life and property. So you need to get to a hurricane or get to a tornado safe area. You need to make sure that you're taking cover that is not the time to um, be wondering where you need to go in your home. Those plans need to have already been made during that tornado watch phase. Um, a warning, it's either been cited or it is um, indicated by radar that it is going to happen. All right, a storm surge watch. A storm surge watch means that life-threatening rising water is possible within the next 48 hours. 
So they're saying that the conditions are favorable in our area to see storm surge and that you need to move away from the coastline. You need to go ahead and get out of the area. Versus a storm surge warning, um, life-threatening rising water is uh, possible within the next 36 hours. So that's what a storm surge warning is. One of the first things that I want to talk about is the National Hurricane Center's cone of uncertainty. When a storm is heading towards the east coast of the United States, one of the things that you're going to see is this cone. It's going to be all over the news, all over social media, and people trying to understand what it's, what it's telling you. It's very important for emergency managers to understand what this cone is saying, and it will help us make important evacuation decisions. But I want to spend just a few minutes telling you what it does tell you, but more importantly, what it doesn't, and what a lot of people assume about this cone. So one of the first things I want to talk about is that this cone only tells you where the eye of the storm or the center of the storm might go. A lot of people assume that it's the entire storm and that the outskirts of that cone are the entire impacts and that all of the impacts lie with inside of it. That's not true. It's saying that the eye of the storm might fall somewhere within that cone 60% of the time. So that's another 40% of the time that 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 cone could in fact be wrong. And a lot of times people see this H or M and assume that that's the center of the storm and that that's where the exact center is going to be. But in fact, the National Hurricane Center is saying that the eye of the storm could be anywhere. It could be all the way to the far left of that cone or it could be all the way to the far right of that cone and their forecast would still be correct. As you can see here, that is a large swath of land and water that the eye of the storm could go. And those are various different impacts. If that storm were to track all the way to the right side of that cone, that's going to be a very different storm for us than if that, tr if that track were to go all the way to the left side of that cone. That would put us on the right side of the storm, which as we learned earlier, is the deadliest part of the storm. The forward speed and the direction of the storm are included on this graphic. You can see those at the bottom. So we talked earlier about how the forward speed makes a huge impact on our, on our storm system and what we could see here locally. Now this graphic shows that the movement is westward at eight miles an hour. So that's a pretty fast moving storm. It will continue to fluctuate with each and every update that comes from the National Hurricane Center. This graphic will also show you current watches and warnings. That's what the red and the pink are. So you can see at the bottom, it says watches and warnings. Um, you can see hurricane and tropical storm throughout the entire graphic and as it's hitting different portions of the islands and later on as it hits different portions of Florida and of Georgia. Now, what this graphic does not tell you it does not tell you the size of the storm. Just because you see that there's a giant cone here, that does not mean that every part of that cone, one, is going to be affected, or two, is not going to be affected. So, impacts of this storm, of Dorian, can and more than likely will extend outside of that cone. So, the storm that it's showing here is a very small X down at the bottom where it says 11 a.m. Saturday. The storm is much larger than that. It, the impacts of it will continue to expand out beyond. So as it continues to move up and move towards the Georgia coast, those impacts could stretch far beyond what it's showing in this map. This graphic does not tell you the intensity of the storm. We talked earlier about how storm surge and flooding are all affected by the intensity of the storm. This graphic does not tell you any information about the intensity. That's something that you're going to have to learn outside of this graphic. And then also, it does not show you any projected impacts to our area. That's one of the most important things to understand. A lot of people may understand what this graphic is telling them, but don't understand what it's not telling them about the impacts or the intensity 
or what this storm could actually do to our area, which is why we share this graphic, but we do it in a different way. So if you look at your screen now, this is the type of graphic that you're going to see from the Chatham Emergency Management Agency. We've got that cone of uncertainty because people like to understand, they want to see what that cone is doing and how it changes with each and every update. But one of the most important things that we want to draw your attention to is what watches and warnings are in effect. What are we likely to see here in Chatham County? This will help prevent some of that panic. This will help maybe light a fire underneath of you to get ready to go based on the information on this right hand column. So we're going to tell you what type of impacts you can expect here in the county. We're going to talk about what type of winds we're going to see, what type of rainfall is possible, what type of storm surge. If we're expecting storm surge within this particular storm, this is where you're going to see it. We're going to talk about it in our graphics. We're going to talk about it in the text on social media, sending out emails, all kinds of information. But we're not going to just show you that graph. Um, that graphic does not give you enough detail and is too vague for people to understand the intricacies of it. So we want to make sure that you know what the impacts are going to be here in the county so that there's no guesswork when you have to make your evacuation decisions. One of the things that we're also going to be pushing out are our Chatham County evacuation zones. It's so important for you to know and understand what your evacuation zone is before going into hurricane season or before a storm threatens our area. We have three evacuation zones in Chatham County. The red zone is evacuation zone A, and that's the Harry Truman Parkway east to the coast. Evacuation zone B is that mustard color. That's the Harry Truman Parkway west to I-95, and then evacuation zone C is I-95 west to the county line, and that's going to be that purple color. With our evacuation zones comes evacuation terminology. Two important things for you to understand. Evacuation order versus mandatory evacuation order. An evacuation order is that general statement used to urge and encourage residents to evacuate that target area. A mandatory evacuation order is an executive directive. It requires all residents, business owners, visitors, anybody in that target area to evacuate. Personal discretion is not an option. So those are going to be your difference. We are not going to use the term voluntary evacuation order that does not exist in Chatham County and it's actually disappearing across the eastern uh, United States. When you hear the term volunteer, it doesn't incite that you need to take action. It says it's a possibility for you to take action or you can do it if you really want to. We don't want to send that message. We want to send that you need to leave. It is in your best interest to leave and there is an evacuation order. And then one step further from that is a mandatory evacuation order. All right, so there's your terminology. Let's talk about what you can do in creating your family emergency plan. There are five questions that I want you to really think about. They're listed here. The first one, how will I receive emergency alerts and warnings? This is so incredibly important. You need to make sure that you know what's going on in your community. You need to know when there's a tornado watch, when there's a tornado warning. You need to know if we're anticipating severe weather, if there's a hurricane that's heading this way. Hurricanes typically give us a good amount of head start of, hey, we're headed towards you know, the United States in some capacity. We're gonna start pushing out messaging. We're gonna start saying, hey, this might be something to keep an eye on. Find a way to receive emergency alerts, whether it's through SEMA, whether it's through a local news agency, find a way to receive those alerts. What is my shelter plan? Not every time there is a tropical storm are we going to evacuate. It, it doesn't necessarily mean just because a tropical storm is heading this way that we're automatically going to pack our bags and, and head out. Hurricane Michael is a perfect example of that. It headed up through South Georgia and hit us backwards. Um, whereas normally we get storms that head in from the Atlantic directly, that one was slightly different. 
So not every hurricane are we going to evacuate. So do you feel comfortable staying in your current residence and your home in a high wind event? If not, do you have another place that you can go? Do you have a place where you can shelter in place and feel comfortable? That's incredibly important. Another part of what is my shelter plan, if you have to evacuate, where are you going to shelter somewhere else? So there, it's two different parts of where can I shelter and what does my shelter plan look like? What is my evacuation plan? There are three questions that go along with this. Everybody has their own threshold, but your threshold needs to be, when will I leave? What does that look like? What is it going to take? There are some people that hear the word hurricane and they have already packed their bags and they are already long gone. Are you that type of person? Or do you like to question a little bit more? Do you wanna have more of a conversation with my office or more of a conversation with a local uh, forecast agency? Do you wanna have a better idea of what those anticipated signs are going to be? What, what's going to happen here locally? Have those conversations, but work with your family and say, this is our trigger word. This is what we're going to do when this happens. Go ahead and have those conversations with your family so that you're not arguing, you're not guessing during or right before a storm is approaching our area. Where will you go? Start having those conversations of where will you evacuate and then have a backup plan for where you'll evacuate. Let's think back to Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Irma was originally gonna be a category three direct hit to Chatham County. And then it continued to shift and shift and shift some more. And it ended up going over top of Macon, over top of Atlanta, where a lot of our Chatham County residents evacuated too. So what's gonna be your backup plan? If your first plan is to head west, what's gonna be your plan if that no longer works? Start thinking through that process. And then lastly, how are you going to get there? What type of transportation do you have? Do you have transportation that will successfully get you out of Chatham County if we have a hurricane evacuation? Start having those conversations with your friends, with your family, and figure out how you're gonna get out of town. What is my family or household communication plan? We'll talk about what a communication plan is and what you can do in just a few minutes. And then what supplies do we need? What supplies do we need to maintain a shelter in place environment? And what supplies do we need to evacuate? We'll talk about that too. First, how can I receive those emergency alerts? There are so many different emergency alerts that you can sign up for these days. SEMA has our own emergency alerts through SEMA Alert, where you can sign up on our website at chathamemergency.org. You could follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we're also on Nextdoor or you can find that local news agency that you feel comfortable with and you can receive their emergency alerts. Find a way to receive alerts and go ahead and sign up for them now. Evacuation transportation. If some of my questions made you wonder, well, how will my family evacuate? What will that look like here? And, and how will I make sure that my family is taken care of? There is evacuation transportation available provided by Chatham County. If you want assistance getting to a public shelter in an inland county, you can take any Chatham area transit bus to the Savannah Civic Center. When there is an evacuation in place, Chatham area transit is free to everyone to be able to get to the Savannah Civic Center. You can register at the evacuation assembly area, which will be open, and you can shuttle to an inland county shelter on a bus. What can you bring with you? You can bring one small to medium hand carry bag. You cannot bring your entire closet. You can't bring a whole slew of supplies. Um, just try to keep it to one hand carry bag per person. And also realize that pets can be accepted. So if you have an animal or two in your home and you want to evacuate with them, absolutely bring them to the Savannah Civic Center at the evacuation assembly area. We will board them up on a separate bus and they will go to an animal shelter where they will be taken care of and you will be provided transportation to visit them as you would like in your um, destination once you're in a safe location. If you have reliable transportation, you need to use it. This is for people that do not have their own way to get out of town during an evacuation setting. 
There's also a resource for people that might have a functional access or medical need and would like assistance evacuating out of Chatham County. Now the purpose of the hurricane registry here is to provide residents a means of safe evacuation. So it's kind of broken up into two different categories. You have a functional or access need category and a medical need category. Functional or access needs are individuals who may need extra assistance maintaining their independence in a shelter. So this could be someone that day in and day out, they're perfectly fine being able to function in their own environment. But you put them in a stressful environment, you put them in a hurricane evacuation, they may not be able to be independent in a shelter by themselves. Now on the other end, you have medical needs. Now these are people who require the support of a trained medical professional in a shelter setting or may need to be placed in a long-term care facility or a hospital facility. Uh, these are people that might be on dialysis, people that are on bed rest for any given reason that need that help of a, of a professional to maintain their independence. So if you are, know someone or you yourself may qualify, um, for the Hurricane Registry, please call this hotline here. It's 1-833-CHD-REGISTER. And you can talk to somebody at the health department. This is run by the Coastal Health District and the health department. Um, and they create this registry and they make sure that people are updated on it regularly and taken care of. If you think you or someone you love may qualify for this, please have them call now. Do not wait until a storm is heading our way. This is something that you need to do prior to a storm coming towards Chatham County. All right, your family communication plan. A lot of times people assume that cell phones will forever be around or that you know, your, your battery will never die or nothing will ever happen. Um, one of the things that we want you to really start to do is collect information and write it down on a piece of paper. I know it seems almost archaic um, to, to write things down on a piece of paper anymore, but part of your communication strategy with your family should be writing down the contact information for any family member, other important relatives or people, offices that you may need to get in contact during an emergency situation, such as a medical facility, a doctor, a school, or other service providers things that you would normally have to Google or look up in your phone, go ahead and write those down on a sheet of paper. If you have access to a laminator, that would be awesome because then it's waterproof. You don't have to worry about dropping that in a puddle or dropping it or getting water on it or spilling your coffee on it. But go ahead and collect that information and make multiple copies of it. And that's gonna be part of number two here, which is share that information. So make sure that Everyone in your family has access to it. Make sure that grandparents have access, aunts and uncles if they need access. Make sure that kids keep a copy in their backpack, parents keep copies in their wallet or in their purse so that they have access to it. If electronics were to go out, if internet were to go down and you needed to, to contact family members, if you needed to contact the pediatrician, whatever it is, it's important for you to write down those numbers and make sure that you're ready to go. Number three of your family communication plan is going to be practice that. Make sure that you're updating it regularly. Have household meetings where you talk about what would happen if communications went down and talk about how your kids would need to find that sheet of paper in their backpack or find that sheet of paper um, in their emergency kit or on the fridge in your home and how they would contact those different relatives or those different agencies in their home. All right, disaster supplies. What do you need to be able to be effective during an emergency situation? We highly recommend that you go ahead and build your emergency kit. Uh, we have things on our website that talk about a five gallon bucket. Whatever container works for you, if that's an Amazon box or if that's a suitcase like what's pictured here, find a container that can hold your supplies and make sure that you're ready. Some of the supplies that we suggest putting in here, drinking water. We want you to have drinking water one gallon per person per day. Now we say drinking water, but this water can be used for all kinds of things. It can be used for sanitation, and it could be used for bathing, it could be used for drinking. Um, having that much water gives you some flexibility to be able to do things like clean yourself up. 
Non-perishable food. You want to make sure that you've got food that's not going to go bad. You don't want to put things like lunch meat or anything like that, but you want canned goods or pouches of tuna um, or, or uh, ramen noodles is a perfectly good example. Food that's not going to go bad if it sits in a closet or if it sits under your bed. You want to have important medication. Now that's not something that you may want to keep in your bucket all the time if it's medication that you take for your heart or something on a daily basis, but it's not a bad idea to have medi medication such as Tylenol or Benadryl or things that you keep that you may need during an emergency situation that wouldn't necessarily need to be used on a day in and day out basis. And then also any essential devices. I wear contacts. So one of my essential devices is going to be an extra pair of contacts that would sit in my emergency kit. Now I can trade it out with a fresh pair of contacts every year when I get new contacts in, but make sure that you have something that, if, that you rely on on a daily basis, an extra if possible, throw that in your emergency kit. You want to include copies of important documentation if you've got them. And then you want to store it in an easy to access location. You don't want to put it in a super complex place. You want to make sure that if you had to get out very quickly, that this could absolutely come with you in a quick fashion. Other emergency supplies that you could consider putting in your kit, a battery powdered radio, flashlight, extra batteries, first aid kit. One thing to absolutely include, extra cash. If you have the ability to put extra cash in your kit, that may help you. Sometimes credit card machines will be down. Um, you may not be able to use a credit card machine if, elec if electricity is out, and you may need to uh, buy something that's essential during your evacuation travels. Keeping some extra cash is always a good idea. For a list of other items that you can include in your emergency kit, go visit our website, chathamemergency.org. You will find all kinds of information and things that you need. A personal recovery plan. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we're going to get out of town. And I know it seems kind of strange to talk about a recovery plan before a hurricane or a tropical storm is coming to our area, but let's talk through some of these things. Returning to Chatham County may be completely different if a storm has truly impacted our area. After a storm is not the time to think do I have insurance? Do I have enough insurance? Do I have flood insurance? We talked about storm surging. What might happen in our community? We know that flood zones are different than storm surge zones and every single place in Chatham County is at risk of storm surge. So that means every single place in Chatham County should have flood insurance. So start thinking through those, those processes are you properly insured? Do you have flood insurance? Read your insurance policy very, very carefully. Sometimes in those policies, there's something called a named storm clause that says if there's a named storm, your insurance deductibles may double. They may triple. You may have a certain deductible when there's not a named storm, but a very high deductible when a, when a storm is named. And by named storm, I mean we call Hurricane Dorian or Hurricane Irma. That's a named storm. When they give it an actual name of a human, that's what we mean by a named storm. So sometimes insurance companies will throw those clauses in there because you have to think thousands of people are going to be calling at once rather than just one single car accident or one tree falling on a roof they're going to have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people calling. So that's why they'll have some of those named storm clauses. So make sure that you understand your policy in its entirety. Did you photograph or document the information and the, and the items that you have in your home? After the storm, you don't want to be asking yourself that. You want to ask yourself now. If you had to file an insurance policy because your home looked like one of these in, in this photo, and you lost everything inside. Do you know every single thing off the top of your head that's inside of your home right now? Can you document each and every piece of it? Do you have serial numbers? Can you say exactly what year your television is? Exactly what year your vacuum is? All of that stuff is going to be so critically important if you have to file an insurance claim. So thinking about those things now, 
It could be as simple as taking a video of your living room or taking a video of your bedroom because a video is going to help you say, oh, I forgot about my nightstand or I forgot about that iPod that I had. I need to make sure to write that down. So document all those things inside of your home now and I promise you it will make your life that much easier later. When you're thinking about recovery, can you withstand staying in your home without utilities for an extended period of time? Or will you need to be able to stay in a different location? Are you going to have to stay in a hotel? Do you have the financial stability to be able to stay in a hotel for an extended period of time? Start having those conversations. Start thinking about it. Where are you going to stay during those repairs? If your home looks like one of these in this photo, you can't stay there. So what's going to be your backup plan? All right, let's spend just a few minutes talking about what to do during a hurricane or tropical weather event. So not every storm I mentioned earlier, are we going to evacuate? One of the first things that you need to do if you did not evacuate during a storm, whether there was an evacuation order and you chose not to evacuate, or whether it's the type of storm that didn't call for an evacuation, you need to stay inside. Even if the storm seems like it might be over, it seems like it might be safe, might be safe to get out. Hang tight for just a little bit longer. It could be that the storm's eye is over top of us, or it could be that there's another band coming right behind it. Tune into local news to make sure that you know that that storm is over before you decide to head outside. You need to stay away from windows and doors. A hurricane is nothing to joke about. It's nothing that you need to document or try to follow around. It's just like a tornado warning where you need to seek shelter and you need to stay inside. You want to make sure that you're not near windows, not near doors, or not near those outside walls. Winds could pick up unexpectedly. Um, they could pick up or in increase very, very quickly. So you just want to make sure that you're staying as, as safe as possible. And keep in mind that if there is an evacuation order and you chose not to listen to it or not to heed those warnings, once we, once we reach sustained tropical storm force winds, it may not be safe for our first responders to come get you. And that's something that we absolutely want you to understand. If you choose to stay, you could very well be on your own. It's so incredibly dangerous for us to put these high profile vehicles out on the road, such as an ambulance or a fire truck, uh, because the winds could easily topple them over. So we have to think of the safety of our first responders. If you were to fall, if you were to have a heart attack in the height of a storm, you may be on your own. So keep that in mind. Be ready to take care of yourself and others inside of your home during the height of the storm. How to stay informed. Whether you evacuated or whether you stayed right where you, right where you are, you will have various ways that you can stay informed during the storm. First of all, we have a new disaster website ready.chathamcountyga.gov. It's going to have all kinds of information from Chatham County, from each of our municipalities, from our school districts, from other nonprofit and faith-based organizations that are providing support in our area. All of that is going to be compiled into one disaster website. So check it out. SEMA alerts. You can get both text, message, text messages and emails um, by signing up for SEMA alerts. You can register at chathamemergency.org. Watch your local news stations. You can look at their mobile apps or their websites if you've evacuated outside of Chatham County, and you can watch that local news live. Now, if you've lost TV capabilities and you're inside of Chatham County, you can still watch it on your phone. So that's a great resource that we now have um, in this day and age. Social media is incredibly powerful during a storm. You could. We have had multiple reports of people saying that they are trapped or they need help on social media. It's a fantastic resource, but make sure you're looking at official sites. Just because your neighbor or your friend shared some information doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Find information from a local news source or from the city of Savannah, the city of Pooler, city of Port Wentworth, or of course, SEMA. Make sure that you're getting official sources of information, again, and not sharing misinformation. You wanna make sure that everything that you're sharing is as accurate as it possibly can be. 
And then of course, your NOAA weather radio. That will definitely keep you in the loop if you're within Chatham County of all the watches and warnings and weather happenings in our area. All right, so you've weathered the storm or you have evacuated and you have seen the storm pass through on the news and now we're afterwards. Let's see what, what we can do. If you didn't evacuate, if you're safe, stay at home. We don't want you out on the roads. We don't want you out trying to see what the damage looks like. We don't want you out assessing it. We have to make sure that it's safe for everybody to come home and we have to make sure that it's safe first. There could be misplaced wildlife. There could be downed power lines. There could be all kinds of hazards that are all throughout our entire county. Make sure that you're staying home if you're safe. If you're not safe, that would be the time to call 911 and tell them that you need assistance. Um, you could definitely slow down the process if you're out and taking photos or if you're out trying to assess damages while our first responders are out trying to rescue and provide assistance. It's important to mention here again, never walk through flooded waters. You don't know what could be down there. You could find additional wildlife that has been displaced or you could find downed and active power lines and you could electrocute yourself. Never walk through those flood waters. If you evacuated, stay where you are until you are given the all clear. A lot of times people have questions, well, how will we know if the all clear has been given? It's going to go out on news stations. It's going to go out on social media. It will be plastered everywhere for you to know that it is safe for you to come home. Just because you drive back and you're sitting at the border of Chatham County does not mean that we will let you in. We'll talk about reentry in just a minute, but do not leave your safe location until it's safe to do so. Be patient. There is that phased reentry process. It's taken over by the state of Georgia, um, but make sure that you're just waiting until that phased reentry starts and we hit the phase in which you can reenter. Understand that things may look or may be different when you get back. Services that you're accustomed to may not be available. Even if we let people back in, electricity still may be out. Power um, may still be out. Sewage and um, other things that you are accustomed to may not be working properly. So plan accordingly. If you need to stay where you are for an extended period of time before you come home, if you need those resources, make sure that you're planning. Um, there will also likely be a curfew in place, not with every storm, but it's extremely possible that a curfew will be in place. So if you're gonna be traveling back late at night, um, you might wanna reconsider and wait until the next morning. Reentry permits. If you are part of a critical workforce team and you have a reentry permit, you need to understand that that permit gets you in. It does not get your entire family. So if you are in one vehicle and you are trying to return to Chatham County to report back to work, that reentry permit will allow you to come in, but your family will not be able to stay. They will not be able to come into the county. It allows you to enter and report to work immediately. So make sure that you understand that and you plan accordingly. So we talked about these re-entry phases. There are five different phases to get back into the county. Now this is for the entire state of Georgia and you may face multiple re-entry checkpoints if you're coming from another part of Georgia. You may face it at different times throughout your travels. The first phase is that render safe task force. So they're gonna be first responders out throughout the entire county, making sure that it's safe for our first responders to go in and do what we call a life safety workforce. So that's going to be people that are coming in um, to staff our hospitals. That's going to be people that are coming in to do those important life safety measures, such as rescue people from roofs, rescue people uh, that are trapped under debris. Very important stuff. Number three is that essential public and private sector personnel. Believe it or not, that's going to be grocery store personnel. That's going to be um, businesses in our area that need to get back up and running so that we can be a little bit normal when our residents are able to come back in. It would be very frustrating to come back into Chatham County and be able to get to your home, realize that all of your food is completely gone and you don't have a grocery store to be able to replenish your, your food. 
it would be really frustrating to get back and not have food trucks be able to run through the area. So we're going to have nonprofit and faith-based organizations be able to come back during that phase three, and that's your essential public and private sector personnel to bring those resources back up and running. Phase four is when local residents, property owners, business owners are able to get back into our community. That's when you're going to be able to come back in, but keep in mind, you're going to need to have a proof of residency. You're going to need to be able to show that this is where you live or this is where you work and you need to be able to get in. If you cannot provide that, you may not be admitted back into the county. And then phase five is when we are open to the public, but potentially with limited access. So keep in mind that some, res or some mun municipalities may not open their borders entirely. So we've seen it in the past where Chatham County has entered phase five, but Tybee Island has remained restricted because access to the island may not be available. Another thing after a storm, there may be some resources available. It depends on the intensity of the storm and what some of the impacts may have been to our community. Uh, but one thing for sure is that we will likely have damage assessment teams out and about. So these are county or city officials that are collecting information about potential assistance that could become available later on down the road. So we're trying to get an idea of what type of damage has happened in our community. So try not to um, confront these individuals unless they ask you a question directly. Let them get through this process as quickly as possible because that will allow the, p the potential of having that um, assistance moving forward if we can get through it as quickly as possible. Uh, volunteer teams may be in the area. Um, we use a system in Chatham County called the Crisis Cleanup Hotline. It's a 1-800 number that becomes available after a storm. If you need assistance, that number will become readily available for you to call in and ask for a volunteer team to come in. Uh, volunteer teams may also be walking around providing food, providing resources. Be on the lookout for those resources that could be coming your way. Also keep in mind, there is something called the Coastal Empire Disaster Recovery Committee, or CEDRIC, uh, which formed after Hurricane Matthew in 2016 that helps individuals recover after a disaster. So if we don't qualify for FEMA assistance or FEMA assistance doesn't offer you what you need to really fix your home or put yourself back in a, in a comfortable place, CEDRIC could be able to help, and that's something else that you can certainly look out for. FEMA assistance is always a hot topic after a disaster, or especially after a hurricane. FEMA assistance is broken up into two different categories, individual assistance and public assistance. Individual assistance is when the general public will be able to ask FEMA to provide them financial assistance. So that means me as an individual or you as an individual can go to the Disaster Recovery Center or you can go online and say, hey, this happened to my home and I need some extra assistance. Public assistance is what helps our uh, county governments, our city governments get back up and running if they've had um, financial hardship because of a hurricane or because of a disaster. So public assistance will help rebuild things as parks or infrastructure such as our roadways or transportation problems. Uh, public assistance is typically granted during or after a, a, a hurricane or some type of big disaster. And then one last thing to, to mention here is the Small Business Administration, or SBA. It's typically coupled with FEMA individual assistance. A lot of times people have questions about, F, S, about SBA, and they don't want to take out a loan, or they think, I'm an individual, and I don't need to take out a small business loan. If there is an individual assistance declaration, and FEMA is handing out money and handing out assistance. If you are given the opportunity to fill out a small business administration loan, you need to take them up on that offer. Even if you don't want to take out a loan, even if you know that you don't qualify to take out a loan, you have to finish that entire process. Because if you don't, then you may not be eligible for that FEMA assistance. So you're required to fill out that application. Make sure that you do it so that you can receive the most benefits that are possible for you. That was a lot of information that we shared with you today that talked about the basics of hurricanes, 
what you can do before a hurricane, what you should do in the middle of a hurricane or a tropical storm, and then some of the things that could happen afterwards. So much of information that we've covered today, and now I'd like to open it up if you have any questions. Feel free to call us at 912-201-4500, comment um, on our Facebook page, our Twitter, um, or our Instagram. Feel free to reach out in any possible way. We'd love to answer your questions and find out how we can help you be a more resilient member of Chatham County. Thank you so much.